is Isaac Morehouse. Welcome to the podcast where we discuss education, entrepreneurship, big ideas, how to put them into practice in the real world, and above all, how to live free. Welcome back to the podcast. Happy 2016, the year of our Lord, 2016. On this inaugural episode of the new year, I'm joined by my co-conspirator, TK Coleman. TK, thanks for being here. Hey man, it's the most wonderful time. You can't of the- you can't sing that after the holidays. No, 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 man. Listen, every year I I start my Christmas music like early, like in March, and people are always complaining. <laughs> Wait, They're always March. saying, Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I end in February, like around Valentine's, and I start <laughs> back up again around March. So you have but- a, like two week break. Right. But everyone's always complaining. All my friends are always like, oh, at least let me get to Halloween. At least let me get to Thanksgiving. So I feel like I have to wait on everybody else for so long that it's not fair that I just basically get from after Thanksgiving until the day after Christmas. I feel like you ought to get at least like a three week extension of playing Christmas music and that being socially acceptable at least a week after new year's. Come on. I mean, I love Christmas music much to like most people's chagrin. Uh, but for me, I have to resist, resist. I try to wait until after Thanksgiving, but usually I can't quite get there. Usually the week of Thanksgiving, but I mean, you, you take it to a, to a level that's just obscene. I'm, I'm not sure what to say. I'm like, the you Christmas sir, ver- disgust I'm like the Christmas me. version of, I'm like the Christmas version of Darth Vader. Like I've given <laughs> myself over to the light side <laughs> and I'm consumed by, by Christmas music. You hate America and everything that it stands for. <laughs> All right. Um, so New Year's, do you, are you somebody who makes New Year's resolutions? Do you see this, this symbolic changing of a date on a calendar as having sort of deeper meaning for you or do you not really care? Okay, so me personally, I don't make New Year's resolutions because I feel like I'm always setting new goals for myself anyway. So New Year's is just kind of like another day for me in that regard. But however, I do, I do passionately distinguish myself from people that that harp on it and that criticize people that make New Year's resolutions. I, I think there's a tremendous value in lots of people placing their attention on a single thing. I think there's a lot of value in like everybody being on the same wavelength. And I, and I do think New Year's is a day where a lot of people, it's easier for them than it is on other days to think about the areas of their life they want to change. And I think that's a good thing. So I celebrate it when people make New Year's resolutions, man. Have you ever met someone that made a New Year's resolution that involved doing something differently for you know the entire New Year uh, who at the end of the year, they do a retrospective and they revisit whether they accomplished it and they say, yes, I actually accomplished it. No, so I, I haven't seen that. Uh, you know, there may be examples of that out there. Um, but what I have seen is, you know, people setting more realistic expectations like, OK, so it's the new year. Here are some areas I want to change. So, you know, for the first couple of weeks, I'm going to do it like this or where, where people take almost like a, a similar approach to, to how Catholics treat Lent, you know, where, where they say, for a specific amount of time, I'm going to make this kind of sacrifice or I'm going to adopt this kind of hobby. And, and that's going to be my New Year's resolution to do something different, not yeah. like a year long, you know, personal development project. I yeah. think that's a lot. Harder, I mean, I you feel, know? No, I feel like it's so much. I feel like for me, you know, I can't if I set some big lofty goal this year, I'm never going to, you know, whatever, stay up past 11 and I'm going to get up at five or whatever. It's it's such a big, drastic change. I would rather, I would rather make my goal to be by the end of this year, I will be the type of person who is capable of that level of change because right now I'm not. And so implementing a new schedule for a person who is not conditioned to that schedule yet and doesn't have the willpower, who, who it hasn't, it hasn't become habitual. So to me, it's like, instead of a big lofty goal, I love tiny little daily challenges like, okay, um, I'm going to, you know, this is one that I do one form of exercise every single day, seven days a week. And it's like, you know, if, it, if you're laying in bed and you realize, crap, I didn't do my exercise today, like freaking get out of bed and do one push up. At least you did something. And if you do something every day, something really, really tiny with no excuse to escape, um, then you become the type of person who is capable of sticking to some sort of schedule like that. 
And then, and then you can look at the compounding effect. If I improve myself by 1% every day at the end of the year, I'm better by whatever. I think I've seen the math on this recently, like 37 and a half percent or something like that. Right? Like yeah. it's a, it's a massive increase over time with the compounding effect. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm sort of more of a, like, don't do anything. There, there should be nothing about this moment that you're going to magically gain power to do things you otherwise wouldn't be able to do, but make it your goal so that at the end of the year, next year, when you're thinking of making a new year's resolution, instead of looking forward, look backwards and say, am I closer to the person I want to be this year than I was a year ago? Um, and if not, or even if so, how can I make that happen again in the next year? Okay. Okay. Speaking oh, of absolutely, man. Except I, I, I may, I may question your, your belief there that you're not going to get any like magical ability to, to create changes. I, I think, I think maybe a case could be made that you will, because if you think about it, peer pressure for both better and worse has a huge impact on the kind of people we become. And I mean, I mean th think about all the times. Yeah, but T, where... come on, come on. And when you're doing it out of peer pressure, you're not going to be able to sustain that. It has to be done out of a deeper motivation to make it sustainable. That's why everybody goes to the gym for January, but doesn't go in the rest of the year because like there's the peer pressure, but that that can only take you so far. Yeah, that's if, true. If that's you true. lean on that magic, right? Once you're already the type of person who's capable of discipline, then then those magical moments, those moments of big inertia, whether it's a, a date on a calendar with a celebration or some opportunity that comes your way, now you're the type of person who is capable of parlaying that into sustained success. Fine, dude. I'm gonna be like passive aggressive yeah. when you're right about stuff. Yeah. Fine. No, Back. no, you're, you're absolutely right. Like, Back th there's off. a magical, there, there's a magical ability to initiate goals. Yes. Um, yes. But, but yeah, no magical ability to sustain. And, and I like everything that you said. There's a guy on Reddit who calls that non-zero days. You know, just like the one push-up sort of thing. Yes. He says make every day a non-zero, a non-zero day, and and uh, you'll eventually become. The, the kind of person you need to be. James Clear talks about this a lot as well, where he says, don't focus so much on what you want to achieve, but focus on gradually becoming the kind of person for whom that will be natural. So instead of saying, oh, I, I got to lose, you know, 30 pounds, or I got to be skinny, well, or I got to be physically fit. Well, instead of that, focus on becoming, you know, becoming the kind of person for whom that would be the natural byproduct. Like a person who's physically fit, what do they do? Where, well, they go to the gym or they exercise. Okay, so why don't I just make it a goal to go to the gym once a week or to exercise once a week and just make small little investments in becoming the kind of person for whom certain outcomes are you know, natural. You got to be real careful with uh, the definitions too, um, because it's easy to lie to yourself or, or to be truthful to the letter of the law. Uh, I had a, I had go to the gym uh, as a goal one time <laughs> for like a couple of years ago when I lived in DC and I had this great gym membership right next to work. Um, and the gym happened to have a sauna, which was amazing and a steam shower and no one was ever in them. Uh, so I went to the gym every day and sometimes I would stay for like an hour and I'd come home and I'd be like, yeah, I'm a little late, honey. I had to go to the gym. She's like, wow, I'm so proud. You've been going to the gym every day. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to the gym. It's great. I'll tell you that steam shower, that steam shower really did wonders for my biceps. Okay. Um, speaking of newness, uh, once again, I want to thank Tim LeVan Miller for the brand new intro music that you heard opening this show up. Uh, I love it. It's an original creation just for this podcast. It's got a little of that rebellious edge to it, which I appreciate. Some people told me my uh, music from last year was a little too stock inspirational. So um, Tim LeVan Miller, you can check out his music at timlevanmiller.com. TK, before we get into the, the, the topic I want to move to next, which is education, our sponsors, we have two sponsors for the show, the Foundation for Economic Education and Praxis, both of whom you know really, really well. So you give me your 30 second, 60 second pitch for um, fee, a fee seminar, Foundation for Economic Education, who should attend, why should someone attend a fee seminar this summer? Anyone who's passionate about economics or just interested in uh, improving their understanding of what it takes to make the world a freer place and what it what it takes to uh, more effectively navigate the creative challenges of, of interacting with other people effectively, I think they should attend a fee seminar. One of the best things about the fee seminars and workshops is that the people who are there, they want to be there. These aren't people that are going there because they have to jump through some kind of hoop in order to get a degree or a certification. 
These aren't people who are, are there because their parents make them go. The people that are at these seminars want to be there, and they are the most exciting young people in the world to work with, to converse with. And so you're bound to have a really great time just socially and academically. And Fee always brings some of the, the best speakers, teachers, professors, and entrepreneurs from around the world. So uh, if you have a Fee seminar. Yeah. Including yeah. Isaac Morehouse. <laughs> including T.K. Right. Coleman. T.K. Coleman. So, you know, what, what T.K. said about being there by choice, this this filtering process or the self-selection, it's amazing what happens when you separate the credential from a class from the classroom. Um, actually wrote an article for Fee called uh, The Credential is Killing the Classroom. But just that that quality increase, when you sit in, let's say, a college or high school classroom, like most people don't want to be there and they don't care. It's a cost to them. They have to be there because they're, they're trying to get something else. They're trying to get a certification or whatever. At a fee seminar, you'll hear people say things like, this is amazing. This is what I wish college was like. People will be staying up till two in the morning, engaging in ideas because they came there specifically to do that. And the quality is really, really amazing. You make, make some lifelong friends. So check out fee.org slash seminars. If you are in high school or college, um, I highly encourage you to attend one of their seminars. They're usually three days. They have some shorter one day events as well, all over the country. Really, really amazing stuff. TK will be at several this year. I will probably be at several of their one day events this year as well. FEE.org slash seminars, or you can find a link on the Isaac Morehouse uh, page where this podcast is posted. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the other sponsor of this podcast, which is Praxis, the company that both you and I uh, have helped to build and are running right now. TK, who should check out discoverpraxis.com? Anyone who is interested in taking charge of their lives on any level and who is interested in approaching their professional life and their process of personal development from an entrepreneurial or artistic creative standpoint. If you're tired of just doing what you're told and expecting good things to happen for you because you've done what you're told, or if you feel like, you know, the status quo isn't serving you and you want to feel more in charge of your professional destiny, more in charge of your process of becoming the best possible version of yourself, then you got to check us out at Discover Praxis. Got to check us out. I love that. I love the way you're like, hey, man, you got to check us out at Discover Praxis. Check and, us out. You know, uh, what, what are anyone, we talking about? We're talking about Praxis. <laughs> we're talking about Praxis. <laughs> for, anyone, for anyone, as I've mentioned uh, before in the last episode last year, um, who's like, wait a minute, isn't this a conflict of interest? You're advertising this company that you own and, and you run and you're advertising this organization that you are a, a faculty for. No, it's not a conflict of interest, you idiot. No, there is nothing further from the truth. This is highly aligned with my interests. This is everything I care about. The ideas of freedom and economics and, and the ideas that motivate and animate praxis and fee. That's what I live and breathe. So it would be stupid for me to not promote those things and have them as sponsors. So stop complaining. Uh, whoever well, that hypothetical person is. Well, you know, that voice you just used for, for our listeners, that's how Isaac actually hears me. That's the very voice he's been <laughs> using to impersonate me for years. <laughs> you know, it actually reminded me of that that famous Milton Friedman YouTube clip with Phil Donahue. There's this part where Donahue, he just gets into this voice and he starts bobbing his head and he says, but doesn't capitalism just reward greed? You know, it's like this, uh, you know, <laughs> what about the children? It's it's amazing. You should look up that YouTube video. Uh, not only does Milton Friedman have a beautiful salmon colored jacket on, but he does an absolutely devastating job just knocking down that silly criticism. Okay. Hey, hey, wait, wait, hey, man, and I got to say something about this whole conflict of interest thing too. I'll just take a quick little sound bite. Everybody is selling something. Everybody, including the person who says, you know, um, don't listen to anybody that tries to sell you anything. That person is selling you a particular way of looking at reality. They're selling you a very specific idea. So we're not all in the business of selling products or tangible goods, but we're all part of the process of trying to use our influence to persuade other people to think or act in a certain way based on our own values, based on our own preferences and priorities and so forth. So there's nobody out there that's neutral in the sense that they have nothing whatsoever, tangible or intangible, to gain or lose from what it is they're pushing or criticizing and so forth. I had to get that out there because, you know, 
I, I hear this a lot where, where people when people criticize others for promoting something by saying, yeah, but you have something to gain by it. It's like, well, that assumes that that's such a that the opposite of that exists. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. That's OK. Let's stay on this topic, actually, because this is pretty freewheeling. I want to I want to discuss education a little bit, an article that you wrote. Um, but that's 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 I don't have a whole lot of really specific uh, guidelines or places I want to go. So let, let's stick with this because this is something I've been interested in for a long time and I've, I've faced this as well. Um, one one element of this accusation, beware that person's trying to sell you something that I find interesting is is the assumption of the causal, the, the direction of causality. So let's say someone is um, like we do at Praxis, a whole Praxis team, we produce a ton of content. We write, we podcast, we interview, we publish to Medium, to our own blog, to Facebook. We're always talking about ideas of, of how to be entrepreneurial, how to take charge of your own life and education, a whole sort of life philosophy. And we're talking about these things constantly in a lot of different, in a lot of different mediums, including the medium called Medium. That just got really strange. Um, and you didn't laugh at all. I feel lonely now. Can you give me something? It was, a, it was a delay reaction, man. Like I was like, wait, what is he saying? But you were like, oh, what? I got it. You're I, like, is that a I, joke? I chuck- it's terrible. <laughs> no, but um, but so there's this, there's this. Uh, you, you'll see the the sort of you know the uh, socially conscious public service announcement types will be like, hey, just be warned. If you like and share this article, this person's trying to sell something. They want you to like this idea of self-directed learning because they have a program, a business that sells an experience of self-directed learning and they really want you to buy that. And like, that's all fair, whatever, but wouldn't it be more likely that the opposite is true? And in my experience of, of interviewing and knowing a ton of entrepreneurs, it's always the fact that the opposite is true. The, the, the real causal connection isn't this person created a business selling something and then they devised, devised an entire life philosophy and started create, you know, going out there and telling people about this philosophy that they came up with purely as a way to sell their business. It's always the other way around. This person had a life philosophy burning within them for years, and they finally realized this is not only a life philosophy and a set of interesting ideas. You know, the person who blogs about how to be a better social media marketer, they're doing that because they're interested in it. And then one day it clicks Hey, I could actually sell something to people of value that that is a way of sort of implementing these ideas in a business model. And that's usually the way that it folds out. It's like because I'm so passionate about these things, I took I risked everything to launch a business as a way to sort of tangibly do more than just tell people this is a good idea, but offer them a way they can help them implement it. And when you when you see it that way, which is usually how the causal chain goes, um, it's like it's totally common sense. There's nothing sinister about it. I mean, I don't even think it'd be sinister if it went the other direction, but, um, that's one comment. Now I want, I want to ask you something in a second, but another observation, when I used to work for nonprofits, um, you would sometimes get these, you know, arms crossed like, okay, you know, I used to work for the Mackinac center, this, this think tank. Okay. I like this study that was published and the findings all seem good. And the argument is sound, but who's funding it? And, and I would always be baffled by that. I would say, okay, if you like the argument, if you feel like the logic and the data and the anecdotes supporting it are sound and they make a case, let's say for the deregulation of telecom and it's sound and you say, I'm convinced by this argument, what would it matter to you? Like, I mean, if, if, you know, somebody who hated what the Mackinac center did said, I'll give you a million dollars, they'd probably be like, okay, jokes on you. You know, we'll take it to produce somebody who's a big socialist. They'd take it and produce free market research uh, or research that, you know, shows the problems with government or with socialism. And, and, you know, they they have a mission and their work is either good or bad. Like who funds it? To me, it doesn't even matter. Like, you you know, there's all the arguments about, well, you want to keep that secret because those people could get harassed or whatever else. There's good practical reasons for not necessarily announcing to the world who funds nonprofits all the time, but some places do it. Some places don't. But to me, that's such a distraction. It's either a good argument or it's not who cares, right? I mean, who cares if the, if the sugar lobby donated half a million dollars to some think tank and the think tank used the money to make an argument that, uh, sugar subsidies were terrible, right? Like jokes on them. So, I mean, the place either does good work or they don't. And this idea of, again, this is separate from what we're talking about with selling something, um, in some ways, but this idea that who the money comes from is like by itself discredits the argument. It, 
it's, it can be interesting sometimes, and it may help you understand why different people are interested in certain things. But at the end of the day, you got to, you got to analyze the product, whether it's a product or, a, or an argument or a set of ideas, analyze it on its own merits. Who cares? What, what's your take on that? Or where, what am I missing here? Yeah. You know, it, it makes me think of the, uh, the psychogenetic fallacy in philosophy, where if you learn the psychological reason why your opponent makes an argument, then the argument must, you know, therefore be wrong. Um, so, you know, I, I can I can dismiss what you say by saying, yeah, but of course Isaac is going to say that because, you know, he's the founder of Praxis and it benefits him for you to believe what he's saying. Now, that may or may not be true, right? But the truth exists independently of the psychological motivations for why a particular individual might espouse the truth. So it's possible that a person's motives may be evil and nefarious and so forth. It's possible that a person's motives may be good, but we can still evaluate the truth based on the reasons set forth, you know, on its behalf. So, you know, if a thief or a murderer says two plus two equals four, that statement doesn't become false because we can't trust that person, right? Like we can evaluate that claim independently of their character. And, and if an honest man, you know, who devotes his life to nothing but good deeds says two plus two equals five, that statement doesn't become true because of the character or the intentions of that person. Sincerity is not a substitute for truth and insincerity does not negate truth, particularly when that truth can be independently verified. So I'm with you all the way. I think part of the problem and, and there's no one thing that captures it all. There are several angles we can look at this from. But. Part of the problem is we still have this kind of hang up about money. We don't have a problem with people having something to gain, but we get really uncomfortable when the thing to be gained happens to be finance, you know, financial resources. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's take the following example. No, nobody has a problem with selling things to their friends unless they're making money. So, for instance, how many times does the average person um, sell their friends, even to the point of being pushy on things like trying out a new restaurant or going to see a movie or buying a new book. I mean, like we're pushy with each other when we do that. Dude, you got to go see it. <laughs> you got to go see it. And, are, you, and like, are you getting passive aggressive with me about some of the times I try to push books on you? Yeah, totally. <laughs> you're like, man, sometimes people can be real jerks. I mean, really bad. Like you're almost ready to stop talking with them forever. <laughs> I mean, you can be your best friend. Them. Yeah, you're, you're ready to never go on their podcast again, for example. <laughs> I mean, like you, you, Isaac, not that you would do this, but no, yeah, man. I mean, we say, oh, you got to read that book. And, and then a friend, you know, is all casual about it. And it's like, ah, no, seriously, seriously, you'll like it. I did this to my wife last night. I I, I, I tried to convince her to watch The Nightmare Before Christmas. She's, she's like, oh, no, that's too scary. And I was like, oh, no, 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 trust me. It's not scary. Like, I just need you to watch this trailer. Just watch this trailer. And she's like, no, not interested. I'm like, lovey, if you see this trailer, you are not going to be able to sleep tonight without watching this movie. Like, I'm telling you, you got to watch it. And I was really pushy with it. See, now, the, the problem is that she's not motivated enough by money. It'd be so much more efficient if you could be like five bucks and she'd be like, sure, you know, right, so much right. cheaper. <laughs> but, you know, so, OK, so one, one problem that a lot of people encounter when they when they take their first sales job is they have this feeling of guilt, you know, like, is it OK for me to take this person's money? I mean, I know that I'm giving them this product or the service or what have you, but there's something about it that feels dirty because I'm benefiting from it. Now, this is interesting because we can be very comfortable pushing our ideas, pushing recommendations on people when money's not involved, but when money's there, it's like, well, I don't know if I like benefiting from it. And we still benefit from it even when money's not involved. Like we gain the intangible value of um, knowing that we created a positive experience for our friend, you know, like well, well, make, them... make no mistake too. the value of money is also an intangible value. There's nothing objectively valuable about pieces of paper or even pieces of gold. The value they have is purely a result of the psychological predisposition that we and many, many other people have towards them that allows us to exchange them for other things. And even those other things, the value they bring at the end of the day it's subjective and it's psychological in nature. It's the value of the feeling we gain from that experience. So, it, you know, it, 
all value is intangible. It's, it's the, for some reason we treat money in this, in this really strange way. Sorry though. I, I cut you off. Oh yeah. You know, and, and, and there are still a lot of understandings from a lot of different angles that make us very uncomfortable with the notion of making money. Some of it comes from, at least in American culture, even, even for people that don't believe in the Bible, we're affected in a lot of ways by both biblical thinking and misunderstand and, and forms of thinking that result from uh, biblical misunderstanding. So you take, for instance, the oft misquoted verse, the love of money is the root of all evil. There are still people today who say things like money is the root of all evil. The Bible never says that or anything close to it. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. And, and essentially what, it, what it's talking about is the, the prioritization of, of things over people, you know? Um, and, and if you look at it that way, it actually makes sense because if money is the root of all evil, then we have a we have a statement that couldn't be more easily proven to be false. There are lots of crimes that people commit. There are lots of acts of evil that people do that have nothing whatsoever to do with money. However, when you, when you look at it through the lens of people prioritizing possessions or things over people, or people prioritizing things of tangible value over intangible value, value, it makes sense. Like you can actually explain all acts of evil in those terms. So we still have this carryover where we feel guilty about money. You look at the way rich people are um, depicted in, in television shows and movies and so forth, you know, almost like these sort of like unrealistic uh, hyper stereotypes of like the wealthy person who is motivated by nothing more than the desire to manipulate poor people as if they have like, you know, nothing else to do but just manipulate. Um, so I, I think we have a lot of fears about the person we'll become if we make money. Um, we feel like we have to apologize about it. I mean, you even look at someone like Bill Gates who has, has arguably created more value through business than he has through charity. There's no but argument. You kind of get, you, you get the impression that he feels a lot more proud for his philanthropic work, and he feels almost like somewhat apologetic, you know, for the wealth that he created in business. Why? Because when it came to business, although he created a lot more value, he gained value as well. And there's something about that that makes us feel guilty. And so when we feel guilty about that in ourselves, it's only logical that we'll be suspicious of others when, when we evaluate them through those, you know, through, through that lens. So it all comes down to a lack of knowledge of self and a lack of uh, valuing of self or, or love of self in some ways. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. It's all nice. We, we, we wrapped it all up with a bow. Solved. No Solved. problem, right? Uh, dude, we need a call-in uh, version of this, though, because, you know, like, there are a thousand and one people who are just so angry right now. Oh, I can't believe. But what about this? I have a, a cousin who said this, who has a brother who did this, who said this. And I, I wish we could take callers and, and answer their specific questions. You know, I think could, that'd be fun. We could just do different voices and pretend to be callers. <laughs> we, we can do that sometime. Um, I, could, I could call in a Stephen A. Smith. Oh, you want to? Go ahead. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. We we might I might have you do that later. We're gonna save that. <laughs> so so education. Um you education. wrote an article recently on the real innovation in education. Because there's a lot of talk about, you know, disruptive technologies and online learning platforms and massive online open courses, you know, free videos of lectures online and all this stuff. And this is this is gonna change change the nature of education. This is the revolution. Your take is that education absolutely needs a revolution, but the innovation, the real innovation comes from something much more fundamental than technology. Give me your thesis. Oh man. You know, I think this is one of those topics where pardon me for putting it this way. I just, people just don't get it, man. People don't get it. Like in almost every discussion on how technology affects the future of education, the discussion is limited to the latest app, the latest software, the latest website that's going to allow us to do things like improve the efficiency with which we evaluate teachers, you know, uh, or, you know, um, we have lots of discussions about things like, you know, robots teaching kids algebra and stuff like that. And, and, and that's what we're excited about doing all of the things we've always been doing 
but just faster, just cheaper. And in a way that's a lot sexier, you know? Um, and, 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 you know, it's like, what we don't understand is that technology is always a power play that anytime there is a new innovation, that means people who previously lacked a certain kind of power possess that power. And those who created who, who, and those who like who base their value on the ability to serve those who lack power or their ability to grant permission to those who lack power are forced to redefine themselves. So, um, you know, one example of this is if you take something like Uber and, and, and what I'm about to say about Uber does not prove anything about education, but I'm going to make a fundamental point about the way technology changes our lives. So. We usually focus on the fact that technological innovation makes our life, our lives more convenient. So we have Uber now and we focus on the fact that, yeah, like, you know, um, we can get around and, you know, uh, cheaper and, and, and more convenient and, and it's all easier and it's better and it's more fun and so forth. And that's great. But there, there's a political and a power element to this as well. Now that the average person has the ability to give a ride to the average person and make money for that, someone is getting their toes, their toes stepped on. There's someone who had power that has now just lost power. They, ha they have less of an ability to be able to dictate and define the terms and conditions of your life. And I, I think when you think about the way technology is going to affect education, this is the biggest way it's going to happen. Right now, the, the, the value of education has been predominantly based on a couple of things how we answer two basic questions. And I, and I talk about this in the article. Um, how do we gain access to experts? And how do we become an expert ourselves? And traditionally, the way you gain access to experts is, uh, uh, and, and the way you become an expert, it's, it's geography and gatekeepers. It's all based on either where you're born, where you live, and who you know, like those factors. And it's based on you know, status or credentials you can acquire that will allow you to get past the gatekeepers. So if you want to become an expert or if you want to gain access to experts, for the most part, your two options come down to that. You got to be born in the right place or you got to live in the right place or you got to find a way to acquire socioeconomic status so that you can gain access to the right people. And the value of traditional schooling has been they've been able to sort of solve these problems. And all of the problems of schooling as well have been where they could not solve these problems for certain kinds of people. Well, what technology is doing now is it's number one, providing people with an alternative way of gaining their credentials. You have a number of different companies and programs and learning institutions that are competing with the traditional model in order to become alternative gatekeepers. So people who could not initially gain credentials in the conventional way now have a greater array of options for how they can get those credentials. And while that's happening, at the same time that that's happening, you have the traditional model is being attacked on the other side where the need to have traditional credentials is actually being undermined by people's ability to access experts and establish themselves as experts without having a credential because they have more ways of directly connecting with their audience and building a reputation and proving their ability to establish value. So while everybody's sort of like focusing on, you know, MOOCs and online learning and how, you know, we can sort of like watch, you know, a Stanford class in quantum physics on the internet, what's really happening is something that is so much bigger than all of this. The, 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 there, there's a level of competition that's entering the education marketplace that is unprecedented. People are gonna have more options than ever before for who they can learn from, what they can learn, how they can learn it, and that's gonna put greater pressure on the establishment than, than, than what has ever been. Uh, you know, like, for instance, even just, let's say 15 years ago, if you were taking a philosophy class or if you wanted to learn piano, the teacher that lived in your neighborhood or the teacher that worked at your college, that's pretty much all you had, you know? And now you can have teachers who live in different countries, different cities, different states, 
different universities, you can connect with those people. You can be tutored by those people. You can visit those people. You can talk with those people on Skype. This is a reality today, and this is only the beginning. So anytime people have options, they begin to have more demands. They begin to have a, a greater sense of what's available to them and what they have the, the right to expect. And that forces the traditional model to re redefine themselves. And I think in the future, the the process of education is going to become more customer or student oriented. And any learning programs that are not willing to adapt to the needs and demands of their customer, they, they will die. They won't be able to survive. And, and that's not a reality right now, but we're starting to see inklings of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I want to get into a, a, a few things there. Um, one of the things that you brought up, the idea of not only alternative credentialing, different gatekeepers competing to put a stamp of approval on people and that stamp supposedly carrying a, a high market value. I actually think, and, and you mentioned, and the second thing is going more radical than that is removing the gatekeepers, blowing the gates down altogether. That to me is where the huge massive change, not only in education, but in everything is coming. We are moving to an increasingly trustless world. And that is a huge, huge advantage, a trustless world. This is fundamentally the value of the blockchain. I am I am completely enamored with the blockchain and find it to be truly revolutionary. And I think it's, it's in uh, what Peter Diamandis uh, might call the deceptive phase right now, where it's still kind of flying under the radar, but man, is this thing impressive. But the fundamental, the fundamental revolution there is the trustless nature of verifying transactions, an open ledger that verifies whether it's the transfer of money, the transfer of title, the transfer of ownership, who owns an individual unit of information or physical good or whatever it might be. It is now a trustless system. There's no, you don't have to trust a bank or an institution um, or some company to say, we are backing this person. They're good for it. They really do own this. It's an algorithm that is publicly viewable there it's it's verified don't trust it's 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 like you know reputation markets have developed because the cost of if i've never met you before and you walk up to me and say hey i'm this guy you've never met i'm really talented hire me now i'm supposed to just trust uh trust you that you're good but that's very inefficient so what have developed are these basically uh, markets in in reputation where you have to first go to some institution let's say you go to harvard and you basically pay them for their certification, their stamp of approval that says Harvard grad. And now you come to me and say, hey, I'm really smart. Here's my Harvard grad certificate. And I say, okay, I'm trusting the institution of Harvard now instead of you. And that's a, and that's a step in the right direction because Harvard has a long history. There's a, a larger sample size. It's easier to see what kind of people go through there. Um, now I've I've made it less inefficient uh, because I can just, I can trust Harvard, but it's still based on trust. Because I am, I am trusting with any university, not only that they only give degrees to people who are valuable and will be valuable to me, but the university themselves is trusting that every one of their professors only gives passing grades to people who really are smart and deserve passing grades. And there's a more fundamental trust that passing grades in the classroom actually means that this person will be good in the workplace. There's all this trust built into this system. And it's really, really inefficient because we all know that it has a high degree of error. A degree from someplace, a certification, a diploma, it signifies within some range of probability that you are better than an average person without a degree. We don't, we don't, it's definitely not proven that that's a causal relationship. In fact, it's almost for sure not a causal relationship. College didn't make you that way, but the fact that you went there just correlates. You're the type of person who goes there. But it's also, even the correlation is so weak. We know that people, you know, professors pass professional athletes uh, or, or college athletes, even though they didn't get the stuff right. And people hire professors that aren't very good and don't pay attention. And people give out grade inflation. And some places are just pumping out degrees and stuff. And people, you know, you've met some of the people in college. It's like, are this, is this person really going to graduate? They're really going to get a degree that says that they are worth something because I'm not seeing it, right? So it's very inefficient. The future to me, the technology enables us to move like the blockchain to a trustless system where I don't need to say what institution put their stamp of approval on this guy. Was it this one or that one? And which one is better? I can say, let me go see for myself what this guy has done. Let me check the public ledger 
Let me Google him. Google is your new resume. Let me see. What has TK been up to? What is his track record? What are the tangible things he's created? Let me check out his website, his LinkedIn, his Facebook, the things he's built and delivered, the posts he's left on Amazon, reviews of books, the questions he's answered on Quora, his reputation and his track record. Those things are all publicly accessible. I don't have to trust any institution who says, oh, he's good. He's one of us. I can look for myself. And I think people are so unaware that this is right in front of them right now. You can be your own credential. You don't have to say, trust, you know, Western Pennsylvania University or whatever it is that I'm worth hiring. You can say, look for yourself, verify with your own eyes at the tangible value I have created and who I am. It's publicly accessible. And I have all these digital tools that can show and demonstrate that that's a really powerful revolution in my mind. Let, let, let me, let me add something to that. Let's let's go ahead and assume for the sake of argument that the existing model is totally efficient. All right. And let's just like dismiss any criticisms that could be made of it. Like it's perfect. It, it does exactly what it needs to do. Um, and let's also let's also go ahead and say that no one's going to really take these alternative credentials seriously, that, you know, these are just sort of fly by night programs. Let's go ahead and, and assume that as well. And let's also assume that. um Young people today are just not going to be interested in stuff like, you know, publishing their own WordPress blog or, you know, developing their Twitter following or, you know, having a YouTube channel people can subscribe to. Let's assume all of that. Even then, as more and more people get degrees, and, and we definitely see a trend that this is happening, it's, it's, it's definitely becoming easier than ever for people to get a degree. I'm not saying that it's easy to get a degree. It I understand is. there are people I'll out say there. That. <laughs> uh, okay, but, but I, I, I'm, I'm only speaking for the people that don't agree with that, right? I just want to give them that. For the sake of argument, it is, it, you cannot object to the fact that it is easier than it's ever been for people to de get degrees. And more and more people than any point in history have greater access to the loans and so forth that they need to get degrees. And the trend seems to indicate that this is going to only increase. So as more people get degrees, the value of that degree becomes diluted. And the more necessary it becomes, even if a degree is still absolutely vital, the more necessary it becomes for people to pursue alternative ways of distinguishing themselves. So even if a degree is essential, a degree will not be sufficient, right? You'll have to be able to differentiate yourself by saying, all right, here's my blog. Or you'll have to be able to go into a job interview or put on your resume, as the young lady did for Airbnb. It's Nina something. I forget her last name. But um, you'll have to be able to do things like show your ability to create a website or, you know, like show people your, your podcast or your YouTube channel or what have you. And so people are going to be forced to experiment with all of these alternative ways of building their reputation anyway. So it's not like people are only going to experiment with these things if college fails. If college continues to succeed, it is even more likely that people will be forced to experiment with alternative ways of establishing themselves. And once people get a taste of it, that's when they're going to begin to realize not only the power of that model, you know, um, they're not only going to realize the power of that model, but as they move deeper into it, they'll begin to realize as well how, how independent that model is of many of the things they previously thought they had to do. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I see this with employers all the time, even, even the ones that still list degree as a requirement, basically that's a proxy for like, are you a living, breathing human being who hasn't been asleep on the couch for the last four years because they've come to see colleges so dominant. They don't even, they don't even actually require it. It's just like a uh, degree and other things are required because they assume most people without a degree there's some major problem. Now that's becoming less and less of the case, but even if you don't have one, whether you do or don't, that's not going to get you a job. Just like a resume, the resume never gets you the job. If it's really horrible, it can keep you from getting the job, but you have to have something else regardless of the degree. And so, you know, a person who I've talked to tech companies, yeah, whatever their school, I don't care about all that stuff. Have they ever, if they've ever built and launched an app, I don't care how simple it is. That tells me something because getting it from idea to done 
and coming, get, getting over the embarrassment factor of launching something that's not perfect. That's the, those are the key traits necessary in the technology and the software field. If they have those and they've done it, I want to see it. If someone's like, Oh, I'm an engineer. I have engineering skills and I have an engineering degree. Okay. That's cool. A lot of people do. Uh, Hey, here's this little gizmo I built and launched on Kickstarter. And, uh, even if the project failed, I went out there and did it. Or if it got funded a thousand dollars and I delivered, you know, a hundred of these little, you know, whatever, um, things that I developed or designed that speaks volumes for somebody, the ability to act, to demonstrate tangible value, or to even, like you said, in the case of the Airbnb resume, Nina for Airbnb.com or something like that, go to the company and say, you should hire me to create value for you. What's my evidence that you should? I've already created value for you for free. Look what I did. I did this for you. I come up with a report on your target market. I went and, you know, did an audit of your social media presence and this is what I would do. Or, you know, that, that kind of stuff, it's all out there for the taking, uh, but so few people realize it. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to ask oh, you something. Absolutely. Let me say one other quick thing. You always have it's, to get in the last word. This is my show. <laughs> I know, man. All right. This will be quick. I promise. I, I know okay. I, I lie a lot. I lie a lot when I say that, but it, it's kind of funny how we confuse the history of something being necessary with, with creative power. So let's take, for instance, having a phone number. Um, if you want to get a job, chances are you need a phone number. Not because that's some kind of law of the universe. You know, yeah. companies don't formally require that, but it makes sense, right? Like people need to have a way of getting a hold of you. Like you got to have a phone number or an email address if you want to have a job. So that's really, really important. But think of how foolish it would be to think that having a phone number and an email address is going to get you a job. Like it literally says nothing, nothing whatsoever about your ability to create value. It does say something meaningful about you and it does provide you with an advantage over people that don't have it, but it literally will get you nowhere. You know, and you will it's never necessary. Do it's ne understanding why it, it's necessary in so many cases helps you realize that it might not be necessary all the time. As soon as there's something better, like to the, to the extent a degree was and is valuable for a job, the reason it is, is because it's vouching for your reputation. The minute better tools are available to prove your value is the minute that becomes no longer necessary and decreases in value. So understanding why it's required is so fundamental. Instead of just that it's required. Oh, everybody requires a degree, better get one. Well, hold on a second. Why do they require a degree? It's because it's in the absence of any other evidence that's better. If you have evidence that's better, if you're capable of producing something that's more valuable at demonstrating who you are, then the degree doesn't become necessary anymore. Absolutely, man. You said it best. You, hey. I'll let you have... I'll let you have the last word. <laughs> yeah, do you like Bill O'Reilly, man? What do you like Bill O'Reilly? Well, see, you, I'll let you, you have the last word. The last word, and then I just completely took it over. So, uh, <laughs> okay. So on on almost a more fundamental level, when ter in terms of like sort of the philosophy of education or what it is, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a statement. I'm gonna make a claim that I believe, and I will give you my explanation for what I mean by it. But I want you to when I when I make this statement. You tell me what you think of it and how it strikes you or what you think I mean by it. Deal? Sounds good. All right. I always feel like when you're on the show, we're, we're like playing these games where I'm trying to get you to like, you know, follow my script or do some sort of like forced Q&A or something. We're, 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 we're just playing one infinite game, man. That's, <laughs> that's right. Uh, one of both of our favorite books, Finite and Infinite Games by James Kars. Um, okay. I think that knowledge is not very important to education. Now, you tell me what you think I mean by that and 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 what um, whether or not you think that's true. Well, because I know how to interpret people and I don't like look for ways to make people wrong, I look for <laughs> ways to, to make me understand, I'm gonna assume two things about that statement. Number one, you worded it in that way in order to provoke me. Like you're trying to provoke me. You're trying to say something that I'm not going to, that's not going to put me to sleep. You're, you're trying to ruffle my feathers so that you can get me to think and try to like, get me to look at something in a different way. So I'm not going to do the easy thing and say, you're a total idiot for saying knowledge doesn't matter because you contradict yourself. If knowledge doesn't matter, why do you have a podcast, you idiot, right? Um, <laughs> so I, I know, I know you don't believe the most literal interpretation of that statement. So wh when you say knowledge doesn't matter, I'm going to assume that you probably mean something along the lines of um, 
theoretical knowledge apart from that which is necessary for practical application doesn't matter, or continuing to get more and more information as a prerequisite for action is overrated. I'm assuming that, you, that that's somewhere within the ballpark of what you're aiming for, but I would prefer to hear you explain. Yeah, that's, that's, I would, I would, um, I would even go more, more radical. So um, when I say knowledge is not that important for education, I'm thinking of education as a transformative act, education as a process that alters who you are, who you were when you started some sort of educational uh, journey or trip or whatever it might be, uh, or curriculum program is it, who you are at the end of that is a different version of yourself, one that's closer to being able to achieve your goals, that's more of who you want to be. So it's a transformative process and it transforms the lenses through which you see the world, the way that your brain works, the assumptions that you bring to the table, your habits of mind, your habits of action, you become a different person. So knowledge as in understanding of certain factual truths or information is a part of that process, but it's, it is a very impotent part by itself because there's no shortage of information all the time everywhere. And just knowing things is not that valuable. You can go and find things out if you, if you know how to use Google or whatever, um, or ask the right questions. You can find out information really, really easily at any time. There's a huge flow of information. So just imbibing information is of limited value. So let's take a concrete example. Let's say you want to educate yourself on digital marketing, how to be good at digital marketing. I don't think you've received a genuine education on it unless by the end you are transformed into someone who actually is better at digital marketing. Now, just imbibing a bunch of information about what SEO means and different things like that, that's the information necessary for someone who is good at digital marketing. But that information does nothing unless you are someone who is capable and who does, in fact, act on it to, to take certain actions, to behave in certain ways. You actually start uh, using SEO tips in your blog post or your website copy. You actually start a Twitter page and start implementing the techniques that you read about, the knowledge that you gain. And that requires a change in habits. And I think that's what's so fundamentally radical, so revolutionary about the Praxis curriculum that you own as the education director and you've largely sort of put together and, and we've built and honed over the years is that it's not about feeding you information. You know, when you engage in the, the entrepreneurship module or even the, the economics module or whatever it might be, it's not about consume all this content, all this information about this topic and you will somehow be better. It's coupled with actions, practices, uh, blog every day. Uh, you want to be an entrepreneur, set your goals and come up with things that you're going to do every single day to change your habits. You want to learn more about this, uh, actually about, let's say website building. Don't read about it. Actually build a website, have coaching sessions where you work through the things that are holding you back, your fear of putting your stuff out there, your fear of creating your lack of discipline. It's, it's more like fitness trainers who are trying to, to turn something into a habit, to actually change your habits of mind rather than just feeding you different, different information. You know, it's like, it's like if you go and if you go into some health food restaurant, they'll feed you good, healthy food, but by just feeding you the food, they haven't changed your habits. If you're not in that habitat anymore, you are not a person who knows how and has the strength of will and the habits of mind to eat healthy all the time because nothing has fundamentally been transformed about who you are. You've just imbibed good stuff in the short term. And so I think the knowledge component is so overrated and so much of the technological stuff that's being touted, it's all about just different delivery mechanisms for information. Let's just, oh, let's use a fire hose. No, let's use buckets. No, let's use a sprinkler. Let's just dump things on you in a different way. Let's use an IV, you know, but none of that stuff transforms who you are, which is necessary for you to use that information to do something. If you're somebody who doesn't have discipline or you're too afraid to put yourself out there, all the knowledge about how to build an app in the world won't help you because when it comes to actually building it and launching it on the app store, you'll be overcome by your fear of, of failure. And unless you change that mindset and change your habits, um, it's not going to matter. So that's what I mean. How, how does that strike you? Oh man, I absolutely love that. And, and I, I think this brings up a lot of really good points. I mean, for one, it emphasizes the role of action in, in the development of critical thinking. Usually when we talk about education, helping people learn how to think critically, we approach that process 
by limiting ourselves to reading the great works of philosophy and literature and so forth, uh, performing analytical problems and things along those lines, and engaging in conversation that sort of challenges us to, to sort of wrestle with the, with the great ideas and with tough questions. But the part of critical thinking that's often left out is engaging the real world through the process of creating value and solving problems using the information that you learn. I, I, I heard uh, one of my favorite definitions of learning comes from uh, Chalmers Brothers, and that definition of learning is learning is the process of doing what you don't know how to do while you don't know how to do it. Ooh. It's not the process of preparing to do something and then doing it after you're prepared. Who, who is it's that definition it. from? It's a, it's a book called Language and the Pursuit of Happiness by Chalmers Brothers. Man, that is a great say, – say that quote again. I'm always impressed by how you know these quotes verbatim from the books you read. Learning is the process of doing what you don't know how to do while you don't know how to do it. Man, I like that. And that is right. so opposite of how most people view it. Most people are like, well, I have to learn how to do it before I do it. And they're afraid to try until they learn. Well, let me go spend some time in the classroom before I go to a Spanish-speaking country and try to speak Spanish. You know, And it's like, okay, I mean it's not – necessarily bad to, to try to learn, but, but that's the real learning is doing it when you don't know how that is really powerful. Oh, you know, I, I have an older brother who's just a really amazing singer and, and, and I've always tried to be like him and I'm, I'm nowhere near him. But I remember one day when I was much younger, I, you know, I, I said to him, I, I go, what's the key to being a good singer? He says, you really want to know? And I was like, yeah, he's like, I can tell you what to do and you'll get good real fast. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, okay, tell me. He says, go sing in front of a crowd. He was like, stop listening to your albums in the bedroom and singing in the shower and go sing in front of a crowd. Watch how good you get. Watch how fast it happens. Because he knew the value of having something at stake. And he also knew the value of doing something in a context where I could get feedback and where that feedback would matter. He also knew the importance of the character development that would come from having to deal with rejection and criticism and the role that plays in skill development. Now, let me make a different point here too. One problem that I see today, and you see this a lot, you know, on like Facebook and I, you know, is one, one of the reasons we, um, we, um, one of the downsides, rather, of, of not taking this approach you're advocating here is we have lost our ability to handle the experience of disagreement. How many times do we see people dismissing a book, dismissing a thinker, dismissing a teacher or a speaker, or just, just giving up on someone because that person said something ridiculous or something that turned out to be refuted? Now, I think that's a very interesting practice because – I truly don't know of any human teacher or source of knowledge, you know, for which that isn't true. Everybody's everybody has something in their belief system that is questionable or erroneous. Nobody has a flawless, perfect belief system. But one of the reasons we why we don't know how to handle disagreement, why we don't know how to think critically about uh, seemingly contradictory ideas is because we have this schooled mindset where we approach learning with the mentality that says, find the credible source, find the credible authority figure, and then they will tell me what to believe. They will tell me what the right answer is. And then I can take that answer and I will have knowledge. You know, so let, let's take, for instance, uh, some of the dilemmas that arise, like let's take the brand debate. There are a ton of articles out there that tell us things like, you are a brand. The book Startup of You that we use in our curriculum, that's something that we have our participants read. It talks about this idea that you are a personal brand. You may not like to think of yourself in that way, but you have a reputation. And, and saying, I, I, I don't want to have a brand or I don't like thinking of myself as having a brand, that's like saying, I don't want to have a reputation. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to have one. Well, you don't have a choice. That's something that we, the world, do to you. And the only thing that you can do is get involved in the process of trying to make that better or take charge of the elements you can control. So we have this idea that you are a brand and it's very popular in entrepreneurial circles. But there's also this opposing idea. You can equally find articles that say things like you are not a brand. You are a human being. Right. And, and all of these articles, you know, criticize the people who say you are a brand. And most people fall into one of those camps. 
you either have people who like the philosophy that you are a brand, or you have people who despise and critique that philosophy and say, no, that's de dehumanizing. I refuse to believe that. You are not a brand. You are a human being. And the problem is we approach discussions and debates like this with the schooling mindset that says, well, who's right? Who's right? But once you get out there in the real world and you use these ideas, you realize that both of those ideas are right and both of those ideas are wrong because they're conceptual tools. And like you and I've talked about before, every conceptual tool, every tool of any kind works in some situations and it fails in others. There are some situations where you truly need to think of yourself as a brand or you will fail. And there are other circumstances where you need to sort of take a break from thinking of yourself as a brand and not be limited by what your concept of your brand is. So I, I think what you're talking about where you say, hey, it's not about just finding the right source and taking in information and being fed these ideas. It's about taking these ideas and using them. It's about learning, doing the things I don't know how to do while I don't know how to do them. And when you do that, that's what develops that kind of nuanced thinking where you, you don't feel confused by all of the, the different conflicting, seemingly contradictory ideas that are out there. And you're not stressed out and overwhelmed by the fact that literally every entrepreneur is contradicted by another, that every positive insight is contradicted by another insight, that every intelligent piece of advice is contradicted by another intelligent piece of advice. Like you can't find anything nowadays where there aren't hundreds of articles written criticizing that in a very convincing way. And the experience of that isn't confusing at all. It's quite liberating for the person who acts because you just understand it's simply a gamut of tools and it's not a set of doctrines that I have to, you know, pick the right one from. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I, I sort of feel like, like information is so valuable. I, I don't want to de-emphasize the value of, of knowledge information. In fact, I want to do the opposite. I want to say it's so valuable and I respect it so much that I want to work to become the kind of person who can maximize it and use it to the greatest value. If I had information about treasure that was hidden in some mountain somewhere and I came and gave it to uh, a group of people, here is this information about this great treasure that's hidden in this mountain. Who's that information going to be more valuable to? The person who is in a position, they are the type of person who is capable of climbing that mountain to get that treasure versus someone who is incapable of that. They haven't been training. They're not ready to climb mountains. They're afraid of doing it. They have people holding them back or whatever else. The information is going to be more valuable to the person who is focused on getting their habits of mind, getting themselves in a position to where they know how to use it um, than the person who only ever consumes information. So I think that's really like, don't just become someone who consumes information. Don't just consume more become the kind of person, always be making yourself someone who is in a position when information is given to you. Here's a book about how to start a company. You know, here's information about improving your balance sheets in your business. Be the kind of person who knows how to actually use that information and do something with it because you form those, those habits. TK, let me, let me end with uh, asking you what you've learned, what observations in working with Praxis participants, you're doing a lot of coaching and you're sort of working with them on this approach of, Here's a bunch of great content, ideas, information. What are your goals? How can we work to, to create activities and challenges and personal development projects to actually change your mindset and your habits? And, and you know, what are you struggling to overcome? Kind of doing this approach. What, what observations or key takeaways have you made from working with young people trying to do this? Or have you learned anything? Have you observed any, any similarities in the struggles they have or the things that they really value uh, or anything like that? Sure. So in keeping with what you just said, I one observation is that the less inclined people are to act, the more the more confused or overwhelmed they tend to be by information. So most of the people that come into our program, they're very passionate about learning and, and exploring ideas and so forth. And I've observed in a lot of cases a, a direct correlation between, you know, being able to do philosophy in a way that makes them come alive in a way that feels liberating and exciting and using those ideas to engage the world. But whenever there is a hesitancy to engage the world with those ideas, wherever there, there, are, there are fears or levels of resistance that haven't been overcome in relation to acting on those ideas, 
there's almost always confusion over ideas and, and the sense of being overwhelmed by study. And, and so I, I think given the fact that we live at a time where we have more access to information than we've had before, where, you know, I mean, there, there are just tons and tons of pieces of content just that are being produced at an astounding rate. I think it's even more important that we that we see the acquisition of information as sort of being overrated, uh, not only because it's not a substitute for action, but the more information you take in without acting, the more confused and overwhelmed you'll be by that information and you'll suffer from this kind of overload. Um, is, is that along the lines of what you're looking for? Yeah, yeah. I was just curious. Yeah. I, mean, I, I didn't have anything in particular I was fishing for. I'm just, I'm so interested in, you know, I mean, I'm clearly involved, but you're much closer to, to the action of working with working with people who are deliberately attempting to engage in education in a much more self-directed way, in a much more goal-oriented way with goals that they've set for themselves and how hard that can be primarily because so here, of the, the, the schooled mindset. Yeah. So here's another, you know, when, 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 when the participants come into the program, one of the things we talk about from day one, from our opening seminar, I, I think we talk about it almost too much to the point of redundancy, is we talk about how every aspect of the program is open to challenge, meaning that if something isn't working for you, then let's talk about that and let's customize your experience so that it can work for you because there's no point in just studying things and doing things if it's not creating value in your life. Now, that's not the same as saying if it doesn't feel easy, you know, we're not going to have you do it. We're definitely going to challenge you. And sometimes when participants bring certain concerns to us, that's exactly what we do. We challenge them to think critically about how this may how this actually does relate to what their goals are. And sometimes we manage to convince them. Sometimes we go in a different direction. But we talk about this all the time and, and we always say, all right, if there's something that's not helping you out, let us know. Let's customize your experience and have you do things that create value. But one of the hardest things for people to do is to make that switch of looking at criticism as negative and looking at it as something that's positive. Because for the most part, in the school mindset, if you don't like what you're studying or if you don't like how your teacher's presenting it, you don't like what you're learning, you really don't have a choice. And if you criticize, you're, if, if you criticize, you're considered to either be disruptive by authority figures um, or you're, you know, and you may be considered to be cool by your peers. And so something that happens a lot is people go to one of two extremes. They look at all criticism as negative because authority figures reject it and they have a hard time just sort of speaking up and saying, this isn't working for me. And sometimes you find people are suffering silently and you have to have this conversation where you say, well, why would you do that? Like, I'm not I'm not getting excited by you doing things that you don't want to do. Like, this isn't for me. This is for you. Let's do something for you. So that's one that's one common tendency that has to be overcome. And the other, since criticism is often praised by peers, is, is to help participants see that there's nothing inherently valuable about being a critic, that you're not cool just by saying, you know, you're unimpressed by something or just by saying something isn't working for you. The criticism is only a means to an end. It's only a means to figuring out what you do want and, and, and getting involved in the process of creating that. So I, I think these are the two, two of the most difficult and common tendencies for a lot of people to overcome because of the school mindset, learning how to challenge things that aren't serving them, and then learning how to think about those challenges in a creative way and not just in a sort of you know passive dissenting way. TK, this has been awesome. I'm so glad you joined me for the first episode of the new season and the new year. Uh, so in 2016, uh, what are some things that you want to come back on the show and talk about this year? I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm going to say yes to all of them. I just want to hear them. You know, um, you and I had a conversation about sports before that. I think, you know, went by too quickly. I think we probably should have a discussion on the value of sports and um, lessons to be learned from them. But you know what? We really got to battle it out on. Um, and I, I think maybe we tried to do this before, but I'm more ready for you than ever before. 
We need to battle it out on self-help. I am a staunch defendant of self-help philosophy, and everybody like thinks, you know, so critical of it. There was even this article the other day, and I think you were one of the people who shared it about how <laughs> people who share inspirational quotes on Facebook and stuff, like they have a lower IQ. And dude, I, I, sh- I a- only share that with you personally because I, <laughs> I, I don't like it. Was it was one of these like study finds? I always. I hate things that the argument is based on study finds. I just thought it was funny. I was just trying to razz you a little bit. Um, but yeah, you, you're, you're upset about this. No, I'm not upset. Your small, your small brain probably would be offended by that. (laughs) You know what though? We we need to talk about self-help and why it matters, why it's valuable, what the good self-help stuff is, because uh, I'm an, I'm an apologist of self-help man. And I believe that it's one of the most valuable disciplines we need more philosophers getting involved in it, and we need to not let the cheesy, fluffy people who dominate the bestseller list um, to to define what self help is. Hey, uh, maybe, without it, maybe what I could do is I could just go down your Facebook feed and all of the inspirational rainbow pictures and quotes that you post. We could just one at a time. I could just attack you for posting them, and you could try to justify it. <laughs> Sounds good. <man. laughs> You're like, Sounds no, good. no, what a jerk. Uh, somehow when you come on the show, I always come out looking really mean. Maybe, maybe I am, maybe you're like a mirror that reflects my true self. Take the maybe out, man. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks man. Have a good one. You too, bro.